Uber Dolphin. Welcome to the Underground Society Podcast, man. How are you? I'm about to pee my shorts. You were just on tour with Faizo and Prosecute. One time, uh, I think for our Minneapolis show, we all went to Fogo. I, no joke, eat double the amount of meat that both of them ate. And both of them were sick because of how much they ate. And I was completely fine. I'm just built like a tank. You have longer legs, man. You have more places. Yeah, to put yeah I guess I, it's just <laughs> all going to my legs, baby. <laughs> oh, sorry. So I do, I do this thing every day where I take a Snapchat at 420 o'clock. And uh, I've been doing that for like nine years. If you could change one thing about the industry and kind of the current market and climate of today's, you know, bass music scene, what would that be? I like money. Most people are like, there's some fucking bangers in there. Why don't I make a little bit of money off that? It's just like <laughs> stuff like that where I'm just like, oh, I love magenta. That's my thing. If you got magenta, bang my line. <laughs> Uber, welcome to the Underground Society podcast, man. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for having me on. Good, yeah. So before we jump into anything, I, as I was doing my research, I stumbled upon something that was very interesting and it had to do with your name. So I wanted to start there. Uber Dolphin. Where, where does that stem from? And like, how did Uber get developed? At, what was the early phases of that? Because I know that was like the kind of where it stemmed from. A lot of old school dubstep DJs, they... Uh used to just take their Xbox Live gamer tag and use that as their alias. And uh, essentially, I, I got that idea when I was thinking about making dubstep. I'm like, oh, I'll just use my gamer tag. And my gamer tag at the time was Uber Dolphin. So, but everyone would always just call me Uber at the like. And Uber as a rideshare service wasn't really popular. <laughs> yeah. So, so I was just like, oh, well, this I'm sure this won't bite me in the ass <laughs> any, any way, shape or form. But uh, and then yeah, ever, all of a sudden, Uber, the rideshare app came. Yeah. How, and then it, how did that kind of did you have any le legality issues with that at all? Or did you have to do anything to make sure you didn't? I've never had any issues with it. Uh, like, I mean, I've done very minimal research. It's not like I'm a lawyer or anything, but like it seems like if you have a variated, uh, a different enough for, like company and that you can technically share a similar name like. I, 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 Apple probably is like the only exception where they'll like sue your ass into oblivion if you try to uh, do something. But if someone like instead of like a technology, someone said like Apple healthcare or some stuff like that, where it's differentiated and it also has the healthcare like at the end. I think the main reason why I was able to like work with it is because there's no possible like. I've had very minimal confusion with the actual rideshare service. Like I've had people from like Europe or, or something message me on Facebook about like poor ride reviews, but that's only happened like <laughs> once or twice. So that's it's funny. just like as far as confusion uh, goes, it, it wasn't that big of a deal. But I ended up varying it from I think around 2018. So I was producing under Uber for like four years at that point and with an er I've, yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah, i very yeah. variated it to ubur just just to make it a little bit easier but also at the same time it's i saw i sort of shot myself in the foot by <laughs> naming it that but i'm also <laughs> kind of stubborn so i just don't change it <laughs> what, was there any thought of like a rebrand at all ever like once that started to happen because i know uh, i've seen a lot of people do that but Eh, I don't know. It's like, uh, I think name recognition is a little like the thing is with rebrands, like I've seen them happen, like with alias or like artist rebrands and they're producing like slightly different music and it, it just doesn't go over as well with, uh, I think, the audience, like unless you are doing that as like a project, like already associated with your current one, like a complete rebrand tends to not do very well the only thing the only time that i can think where it was actually kind of like kind of worked was uh with wobad the most people don't, don't even know probably know who who wobad yeah. is anymore <laughs> this is very small scale like rhythm dubstep producing like back in like 20 2012 20 i think they made the full on switch to debau uh, which is a name you might have heard before. But uh, yeah, they mostly produce trap, but they used to produce mo like mostly dubstep and Debao was their trap alias. And then they just completely sw shifted over to that. 
Got and it. no longer yeah, produced like, under Wobad. At least for, for someone who's big that I've seen do it successfully is, and I, everyone talks about this one, but Ella Stream, Brails to Ella Stream. That one was pretty successful. But that was like a whole different project in itself. I think too. the main reason why that worked out because uh like Brills was just a massive act. So it's just like it, like it, you can't really work within like the two li- like if Excision said I don't want to do dubstep anymore, I want to do house music. I think Excision has the resources to shift over and have that project be successful. So I think that's more of a not necessarily like uh rebrands are effective tool strategy. It's more or less like established artist has all the resources established artists can and can reestablish as an artist. But also there there was a situation where it's like trap as a genre kind of was on a huge downswing. So and he and saw that move. yeah he saw that like uh a freeform bass, what music, whatever you want to call it. That was on the upswing and people were making a lot of money from that. And he's like, why don't I make a little bit of money off that? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the next thing I wanted to touch on that kind of is a lot of people in the scene. And I've, I've heard people joke about it and stuff. is call you the long boy. Yeah. <laughs> what is where did that kind of come from? And I'm what, tall. what does that mean? It's literally just tall. It. OK, I'm yeah. just I'm just yeah. tall. I mean, like there's a lot of people in dubstep that are taller than me now. Most notably Shaquille, Shaquille O'Neal. O'Neal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I mean, for the longest time, like everyone's like, holy shit, you're way taller than I imagine. I'm like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> hey, you, but, you've taken pictures and stuff and you've met Shaq, haven't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've met Shaq uh, a couple of times and I got a picture with him at Lost Lands 2021. How it was, much shorter uh, are you from him? I'm not that much shorter. There's, I didn't there's think a so. picture. There's a picture on my Instagram. It's like you, you don't I'll even have to scroll. The yeah, in the video. You don't even yeah. have to scroll that far down. I, I look like <laughs> his kid. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, hey, dad, thanks for bringing me out to the festival. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah, like, man, uh, what would it be like guy. to be that guy's kid, man? Oh, gosh. Uh, tall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> uh, well, with those two things, obviously, and even with some of your some of your graphics and stuff like that, you have a lot of like, like it's cartoonish, it's goofy, it's playful. Is that kind of just who you are as a person, you're just kind of letting that shine through. I the brand. really like cartoons. Like I wanted to do like animating, like in like as a kid, and I would like make comic books and stuff like that. Like uh the two things I really, really enjoyed growing up, uh, I really liked playing Pokemon and I really liked watching cartoons. I didn't have cable at home. So if I ever was going out somewhere, like a a literal highlight of my day would just be get to the hotel, turn on the TV, hope they have Cartoon Network. If they have Nickelodeon, <laughs> that's good too. Well, what yeah. were some of your favorite shows back when you were growing up? As far as like tier tier shows, like I think Dexter's Lab is probably like one of the one of the best like original Cartoon Network shows. I love, I absolutely love Scooby Doo growing up. It's like when I was really, really young. What do you think um, about the movies? Because I, I, I know oh, they did well, the Okay, so there's so many Scooby-Doo movies that it's there like is. tough. Like, are you talking about the live action ones? The live ones, ta- yeah. Uh, so the first one's good. I think, yes. I, I think everyone can agree. Like, the first one, it's super goofy. It's super wacky. But, uh, and it's not necessarily like a fucking high cinema sort, sort right. of a film. A lot but of it, <laughs> it was a It was a fun movie with a 2000s level CGI that the whole family can enjoy and i i can definitely appreciate that now if we're talking about like um some of the earlier movies there there's some there's some fucking bangers in there specifically uh the boo brothers the scooby Doo and the boo brothers that. uh well it, it's uh, all of the ones where they have scrappy and shaggy with a red shirt uh, for movies those are bangers like there's the boo brothers there's the one where they're racing cars i thought that was the funniest shit you should watch (laughs) it it's really stupid (laughs) uh and then there's the one where they're teaching a school for with like uh, yeah yeah yeah, little frankenstein and little uh uh vampire i can't remember baby dracula (laughs) something something like that but all those are heaters and then once you get to like uh late 90s early 2000s scooby-doo movies then you have like hex sisters zombie island zombie island's like it's a it's a fucking that's the high class cinema scooby-doo movie we're looking for 
And like six year old me watching that was genuinely scared. I'm like, holy crap, I'm about to pee my shorts. With Scooby Doo, they are fighting monsters and stuff, but something that's not really scary necessarily that I was deathly afraid of when I was growing up is the uh, the original Willy Wonka movie. Oh, that that's shit funny. was terrifying. Well, yeah, yeah, you're just like that kid <laughs> fucking died. Yeah, <laughs> he went into, you can't if you drown in chocolate, you're dead. <laughs> it's like There's, it's like it's mixing the the thing that kids want the most is just a candy land, but then like at the same time, it's very like morbid. Like yeah, <laughs> and, and, and with the oompa loompas, man, no, thank you. <laughs> the fuck, the fucking blueberry, blueberry, uh, per, the one kid that turned into a blueberry, you know. Just uh, Vi- Violet Beauregard, or yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they never tell you what happens afterwards. It's like the the remake. They're like, oh, they just went home. They just went home after that. They <laughs> how do you just go okay. home? <laughs> they didn't die. <laughs> and then you're like, nah. You mentioned that you wanted to do animation at a young age. That you wanted to do that originally professionally, or I just loved cartoons. And uh, when when I got my own little computer, uh, one of the first things I sort of delved into was uh, Newgrounds animation. I never actually got far enough to really do it because it like, I don't know. I, I was like fucking 10, like me torrenting programs. Like I've I, like, I, I know like torrenting programs is like one of the easiest things and one of the most common things that happen to like anyone for anyone trying to get resources for the computer. But uh, hey, it's a lot harder when your brain's like like I don't know how to do arithmetic. Let me try to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try to figure out uh, Adobe. Uh, I forget what they used. It was Flash based, but I forget the specific animation tool that you had to get from Adobe. I got Photoshop though. I was able to figure out how to get Photoshop, which was pretty good enough. Just Dude, no anytime animation. I tried to, anytime I tried to download torrented programs i i don't and i've never gotten into that because every time i try i tried a couple times when i was younger and all that happened was viruses on my computer so i was like you know what i'm just gonna do it amateur the right hour <laughs> yeah <No. laughs> amateur hour. i mean i definitely i definitely fucking trashed some some computers but as far as i'm concerned unless like you build it yourself and constantly uh take care of it and swap out parts and you're just very like inept well not inept uh you're very apt on how computers work yeah Yeah. all that unless you do all that most computers have like a shelf life of five years before they'll eventually shit the bed or start shitting the bed yeah how how did you go did you ever get in talking about the illustration stuff did you ever get into like taking courses or did that how did that kind when did music start for you so i was already always really interested in music i wouldn't say i'm super artistic because that that was like uh i was always interested in like doing artistic stuff and i was always doing artistic stuff but it's not like i was like a renowned child artist sort of shit like I, i was just always doing something like artistic is like a pastime and like I, I love playing video games and like obviously it's like that's an art form in itself but yeah i was just always consumed with like uh doing that and that was like a main priority uh for what i wanted like what i was just doing like growing up and i, I was playing bass guitar at the time like learning all that and uh my buddy showed me dubstep he's like it's got a lot of bass in it and i'm like okay <laughs> and i listened to it and i'm like this doesn't have any bass in it at all. This, yeah, right. <laughs> is, this is like, that's not. And also this track was terrible. The first dubstep track I listened to, he showed me, it was Crispy Predator VIP. And Crispy's a great guy. Good producer and all that. But that song is ass. It is so bad. <laughs> I would not like, that was the first dubstep song that I heard. I'm like, man, that sucked. Technology and stuff. And like just the sound of dubstep back then was night and day different than what it is now too. Yeah. I think like a couple weeks later or something, I got interested. I'm like, yeah, maybe there's some good dubstep out there or something. Because I liked electronic music. There was like a bunch of electronic music that I've liked over the years. I mean, like uh, Prodigy, obviously, it's like great. Uh, One of my favorite tracks, like when I was like a baby, was uh, Crazy Frog and uh, Eiffel 65 Blue. It's like bo- both bangers. Everyone's just like, let's go. <laughs> but um, even to this day, Blue still pops off. Man. Yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, both of those songs are still good. They're great. But I eventually uh, found, uh, I think the first song that I liked that was a dubstep song. It was some Rihanna remix Crispy did. And then I found Dr. P's Sweet Shop. And I'm like, let's go. This is where I'm at. <laughs> and then I 
found Flux Pavilion, Eptic, Cohen Sound. Obviously, Cohen Sound's not dubstep, but like, hey, I'm expanding my horizons over here. I just heard, <laughs> I just heard five songs. So uh, everything's mind blowing at that point. And then I got uh, the following two years, I got crazy into dubstep. I was like constantly loading up my. I think I had an iPod Nano, or I think uh, shortly after I had like my dad. My dad finally. I, I didn't have a phone for the longest time, like growing up, and it's not like I, I was poor or anything. It's just my parents are like, no, you're not getting a phone, dude. I didn't get a phone until <laughs> I was like too much power. Fourteen, maybe, and all my uh, friends 16. got got it. Oh shit! Damn, that's even longer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My yeah. my parents. I think it got to the point to where you know both my parents worked and I was getting like rides ho- ride homes and stuff from like school. And I think there was a couple of times where like they forgot to pick me up or like something happened. And I was stuck and I had to use the office phone. And, like they were like, okay, you're 14 now. We can get you a phone. But for a while, they're like, no, we don't want you to have any electronic. Like stay off, uh, stay off that shit. It's bad for you. <laughs> Well, the first phone I actually got was legitimately a burner phone. It was so funny. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then I eventually got my uh, dad's old, old like iPhone three mm-hmm. or something because he upgraded it to like the six at the time. He's like, let's fucking go. <laughs> We're not yeah, getting rid of this. Say, that's a big jump for iPhone too. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was a very much outdated when I got it, but uh, you know it's fine. Like I was just happy to have something. Anyways. The main part, I, w- I was lo- pretty much downloading everything off SoundCloud and loading up uh, just my iPod with a bunch of dub stuff. And I was just constantly listening to it. It's like on the way to school, on the way back from school, at, like I'd be listening at home. I'd be uh, and I was really into like doing graphic design at the time. I'd be listening while I'm like making pieces and shit like that. And uh, sometimes I'd listen to it when I'm playing Call of Duty. And uh, I was really into Call of Duty at the time, too. And what ended up me shifting into making music was uh, Call of Duty Ghosts, funny enough, because that game sucks so much ass that I'm like, I am done. I'm done (laughs) playing this game. I'm not having fun. I'm going to try to learn how to make dubstep. And I think the uh, year prior, I tried uh, learning how to do it, but I quickly found, like, I, I just gave up pretty quickly and uninstalled everything. I got, like, frustrated. And uh, this time I said, I'm going to watch all the tutorials. I'm going to like take an active measure to learn everything before I even try. Because like uh, I was just like my initial approach. What like I I just got confused with the whole interface and everything. And like, to be fair, I started with FL Studio. It's not necessarily the most inviting interface. It's it's better than some DAW interfaces, too. Like if I started on Reason, I think I'd just fucking like it, it wouldn't have happened. <laughs> Reason's kind of a kind of like it, it's cool, but it's like also a mess <laughs> like to work with. But uh, anyways, with FL Studio, I, I took a very measured approach to learn everything. And I got to a point where I was hand fisting songs together and, and sort of brute force in my way to using using everything and finally started making music. And I've been doing that since 2014. Nice. So yeah, so almost ten years now. You've had you had. I feel like you had a lot of. Cause I've known who you, you're pro, about your project and who you are for shit a while. It's only, it was, I feel like it was like kind of a started to see success earlier on than I think most people normally do, at least in today's day and age. Yeah. Well, I've just been around for a while. I think that was the main thing. Like, I I never had like a quote unquote pop off moment. Like, because I, I mean, there's so many acts where it's like you can point and it's like, this is what did it. This is what did it for me. I've just been like around and consistently like I try to consistently improve, which is it's not easy. It's really not easy, especially yeah. <laughs> now. Uh, but I've always been interested in like making up stuff and I've always just been like wanting to get better and better. And yeah, yeah. So I've just been hanging out <laughs> like you just said you've been around for a long time but now you've you've been doing your own headlining tours and you're just on tour with fizo and prosecute mm-hmm. How, how's that tour going yeah is that over it's yet or is pretty that well oh still- uh, well i think we have the last weekend this week but it's been going really well i thoroughly enjoy traveling and like seeing everyone and i'm really like i'm really honored whenever uh people come out to shows because like 
I know sometimes it's like a literal, uh, like so annoying to get out to shows like as like a spectator, like depending on the area, you might be driving like an hour out and like standing in line, waiting around. You're getting like dinner and everything. It's like a huge cost. It's like your whole evening pretty much revolves around that. And like it is a an actual honor whenever people show up and say, hey, I'm having a good time to this. So uh, yeah, I've been I've been having a great time. What have been some of your favorite stops on this tour? I just came some. back from uh, Texas, and the Houston stop was really fun. I uh, like uh, I Houston it has off. some of the craziest energy, and I love it. But uh, some other good ones. I mean, the LA stop was a lot of fun, and like, hey, I, it's my hometown, so it's like I had a great time. I don't know. There's so many. Like, I I, I don't want to. I've had a pretty pretty overall great time on the tour there's not really any show that i can like point besides like la like just because that's a hometown show so that's kind of cheating there's not one show that i can point to and say this is the best show but i've been having a pretty good time on uh, everything for the most part are you you're originally you were born and raised in la Mm -hmm. yes Oh, okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Well, I mean, technically Orange County, but it's like it's literally the county right under L.A. And most most people are like when I was living in Orange County, uh, people are like, oh, uh, like where you live? I'm like SoCal. So L.A. I'm like, yeah, (laughs) sure. (laughs) Close enough. (laughs) Kind of. (laughs) It's an hour drive from San Francisco, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's crazy. People aren't from here and they're like they they don't understand the concept and the, the such big difference yeah. between north well, and i just SoCal. don't think like, they even know where it is because i i think they know that california is a big state but they would think it's like yeah it's got to be close to la right <laughs> definitely not <laughs> think of driving like florida to new york kind of <laughs> oh my god i mean it's no, a thanks. little bit shorter than that it's a little right? shorter yes yeah, yeah it's yeah, but it, it's, it's it is that is a good way to put it because it is like yeah. exactly that yeah uh, what what about your favorite memory from a tour? If there's like one standout moment that Ooh. was your favorite memory from this past tour? Oh, that's a good question. Or how about this? If there's anything that you that there was like a moment that maybe something happened that you like learned from, and there was like a mass, massive takeaway from this tour. I'm not. This is not really like a favorite memory, but me and me and Faiza, we had uh, uh, some a couple days in between. Uh, our DC stop and our Virginia Beach show and we got to spend two days out in Virginia Beach and it was just really nice to like hang out and just kind of not do anything and then wake up and then be like all right showtime yeah <laughs> and that, that was that was really fun we got like a little mini vacay in between and that that was a good time I don't know like I, I'd really have to like think on, think on that because like there there's a lot of good Good stuff. Oh, like recently, I'm really into Magic the Gathering. And at the Houston show, uh, some of the people who put together the show uh, are on my... Oh, let me let me uh, segue a little bit. Uh, on my rider, which is what I get like before a show, usually people have like drinks and everything. It's like and like chips, snacks. I got an assortment of that. But I also have at, like my one weird thing I have on my rider is a, a pack of Magic the Gathering cards. Nice. <laughs> these guys these guys went above and beyond and then said we're not just going to give this guy a pack they went ahead and set up their decks and everything got a play mat got a bunch of decks for me to play and said we're going to play a uh pod of commander and uh, which is a format where it's like a 1v1 v1 v1 and it was a lot of fun and then afterwards they gave me a deck box with sleeves and a couple singles and i had a great time that like i was that was a lot of fun and a crazy surprise awesome yeah i you know first kind of get the foot in the door type job that i had within the music industry was working for a local production uh company sometimes i'd have to run and get writer and you know get their alcohol get whatever that was on their list there's i forget who it was but someone Someone asked for like a pair of underwear one time, socks, like there's all. I That's feel a pretty like common. Almost, I, I hear socks like is a pretty common thing, but like, I, I don't know whose feet are getting that sweaty. It's like, you don't have <laughs> yeah. socks. And like, you're not bringing you're extra traveling. pairs. Did you, yeah, did you not bring more clothes? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> I see black. T- so there is one where it's a, like actually pretty valid. It's a black t-shirt. And that's for people when they sweat a lot on stage, they don't want to keep wearing their sweaty t-shirt. So they get a 
clean black t-shirt. But I, I, I can appreciate that. But uh, yeah, I I'm, I'm just not that sweaty. So like people are like, do you want towels on stage? I'm like, uh, maybe if I'm like in Florida or something. But, <laughs> <laughs> it's but otherwise, I'm usually maybe. pretty good. Yeah. Back to your tour, being that Prosecute and Fizo were on tour with you. How was that put together? Is it the management teams that kind of brought that together? Or it was a combination kind of, a, of... Did you have um, a say in who you would bring on tour f- with you? It was mostly like my manager, Colin, like figuring it out. But like me and Rob were pretty good friends and we've done stuff together before. So it seemed like a good shoe in. And uh, with Campbell, like I, I, I've known him for a, a bit of time and I like love having him around. I've hung out with him like out in Austin. He's let me stay at his place. It's beautiful. And uh, yeah, and we've had a track together, too. So it's like, yeah, let's just put Campbell on the tour as well and like it turned out to be a really fun tour and like i think everyone had a pretty good time overall that's like pro- the only thing that like is rough about flying tours is uh some sometimes you have to stay up really late to catch your like 4 a.m or 5 a.m flight actually if i could get a 4 a.m flight i'd be so happy because yeah, of, you're, you're done at what like two ish and then yeah. it's like okay by the time you get back grab your shit and get to the yeah, airport a lot of the go. times yeah. i'm staying up to like 7 8 a.m just to make my flight because it's rough. just not worth get, sleeping i've i've always wondered and i think i've asked other people in the past but how, what's your like key of like staying you know healthy and balanced and stuff when you're running or like getting on that type of a sleep schedule I'm just built like a tank. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm like I, I got rugged. <laughs> I'm I've got rugged durability. I, like people say they can't. I, I don't know. I just do it. Well, that, <laughs> like, I'm glad uh, that works for like, you. Then. <laughs> as far as like staying healthy goes, I don't know. Like I, I just like I, I'm really weird because like uh, one time uh, I think for a Minneapolis show, me prosecute and Fiza, we all went to Fogo because we're like, fuck it. We're, mm. we're just going to ball for no reason tonight and get, <laughs> like some crazy good meats. And I no joke, eat double the amount of meat that both of the, them ate. And both of them were sick because of how much they ate. Because of all oh. the meat, and I was completely fine. It's, it's just like <laughs> stuff like that where I'm just like, oh. you have longer legs, man. You have more places. To yeah, put yeah, I guess <laughs> it's just all going to my legs, baby. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I just, I don't know what it is. Like, uh, like I, I do like exercise when I'm at home and everything like that. And like, uh, but as far as like uh, staying healthy, you kind of just eat what you can. On the road, like if I have an option, like I'll, I remember having this. I was like, there was a Shake Shack and there was a Chipotle right next to it. I'm like, I'll probably have the Chipotle. Chipotle. That's a slightly yeah. healthier option. Come on. And yes. get like double chicken and stuff like that. But uh, so it's really just making conscious decisions on what you're putting in your body while you're, even though yeah. you're eating out, there are, you know, leaning towards the healthier options. That's yeah. Smart. And I also have like beef jerky on my rider. So I don't like, uh, I still get a little bit more full and everything like that. But sometimes it's just like, yeah, yeah, you're just going to have to eat like shit. And there's not really much you can do. Like people with dietary restrictions, uh, yeah, that that's tour, tough. It's, it's always really tough for, for them. And I feel bad that uh, they have to subject themselves to some crappy options most of the time. But, how are yeah. you? How's your habits and stuff at home? Are you, are you pretty active and stay healthy at home? Uh, I work out usually two to three times a week. I don't really do much. Like <laughs> when I'm at home, I'm <laughs> usually on my computer. Uh, I'll I'll go to the card shops uh, once or like uh, once or twice a week to play cards, and uh, I'll hang out with friends. I see my parents like once a week, and other than that, I'm kind of just like a I'm a homebody, but. Uh, also, Dude, at I the feel same like the time, music I industry, go out even if a decent amount, even if you are a home or you're not a homebody and you know this is what you want to do, you would think that it's like at least in the with technology and the way it's kind of shaped now, maybe back in the day it would be a little bit, a little bit different because of you know record stores and stuff. But I feel like this industry kind of almost forces you into being more of a homebody because you're on your computer so much, you're you know doing whatever there's especially if you have your own project like there's well, so I many say different it's moving forced. parts i think a lot of people that get into the industry tend to be that type of person there's very few people that are uh successful that i would say are actually like more more of a uh extra going personal yeah. person socially speaking yeah extroverted that, that maybe i'm just 
weird then because I feel like I'm more of definitely more of an extrovert. That's why I have the podcast. I like talking to people, but I feel like I I've spent like I wish I had more time to like go out. A lot well, of the thing is no with like uh, introverted and extroverted, it's not necessarily like it's more of a uh, uh, you could feel more introverted one day and be more extroverted the next. It's not like uh, there there's people that are it's more like a lean. Like I tend to be more extroverted or I tend to be more introverted. And for a lot of that, I find myself kind of right in the middle. Like I'll, I'll literally like spend like a couple days not going outside and then other days i'm just like yeah let's just go out for like every every day for <laughs> the next four days <laughs> fun. do you tend to ever you know at an that the end of a tour like you are now do you feel like you're kind of exhausted for being around people and that you need some time off and to yourself uh, at I, the wouldn't, end of I wouldn't necessarily say i'm exhausted for being around people like the only time that i actually get like that is if uh i am on a bus tour and I am having to do that like uh, a lot of dates. A lot of people say like they're not a fan of fly-in dates because of the airport and everything like that and how much you have to move around and they'd much rather be on a bus. And I totally understand that. Like the benef- excuse me, the benefits of being on a bus def- definitely are noticeable. Like not having to worry about going to the airport, just hopping in and sleeping. I'm not necessarily a bigger big fan of like buses just because I have a little bit tar- tougher time <laughs> fitting in them and everything. Like I, uh, uh, yeah, it's just like I, I I'm just l- long enough to fit in the bus, but it's like I have to go at like angle and usually like put my feet out. Yeah, that'd be t- but, tough for someone as tall yeah. as you. <laughs> it's just when you have so many days in a row when you're touring, touring, touring. Uh, you don't really have as much personal time and also just because like the bus is shared and so like you're just hanging out with everyone which is fine like the last bus tour I was on was uh, with Subtronics and like all all the people on the bus are super chill and like I was with the tile company and like yeah we were hanging out I was hanging out with Jesse uh, e- uh, Leotrix Ethan was on the bus and I toured with him la- the year prior on Epic Tour and uh, Speaking of the Aptic tour, literally everyone like on that bus is like my best friend. <laughs> and it's just like that was like the one tour where everyone was just hanging out with each other. And it's not just because like we were just hanging out because of proximity or anything and, like everything. Everyone was really chill with everyone. That's and awesome. uh, I would think that on a bus tour, especially because you do have to share quarters, not always because there are different personalities that just don't sometimes get along, but if you do and you do get that lucky, I feel like that's where a lot of like your your like you said, best friends are made and because you're so spending so much time. Yeah, you definitely get to know someone a lot better by uh touring with them. But uh, yeah, uh like the thing is like doing bus tours for like uh weeks on a time without like any breaks or anything, you definitely sort it definitely wears on you because you don't really have a, a necessarily like a personal space like for me specifically i i really like having my computer set up it takes me like after a bus tour it takes me a couple weeks to get back into the uh producing mindset because i i get home and like a lot of people say this they'll just do nothing for a week or something like that like the like, I'm not the type of person where I'm like, oh, wow, I'm super motivated to make music from that tour. I'm like, nah, I got to I got to get bored before I, I got to start making music. I got to do I got to do some uh, gaming first. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I've, I'm personally not a big gamer. I don't know. I, I was. And then in eighth grade, I just kind of put it down and focused on other things. And I never got back into it. That's what <laughs> it was like for the longest time. And then, uh, well, I, I, before like, I got into magic, the gathering, one of my buddies, the, one of my best friends, actually, he, he was originally playing it and he was just streaming it and I would just watch him. And eventually I learned how to play it and then I started playing myself. But uh, that, so I don't really play like any video games at the moment, but uh, that is like magic, the gathering mainly like, just magic. Is, yeah. It's pretty much just magic. The yeah. only thing I played before that was I, I was really into playing melee, but um, oh, okay. I've heard of that. I've never yeah. personally played though. Yeah, it's really intense. Like as far as like game difficulty goes, it's I think it's like one of the toughest games to get into and yeah. play at a competent level. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, there's it's, some there's some like that. It's it's almost like like chess. I think is it's not 
very different thing, but well, just talking it, about a it, game difficult. Chess is kind of like well, that. Well, it's too. similar to chess. It's like it plays like literal like the way melee functions. It's like you're playing speed chess or bullet chess where you're making super quick decisions. But like imagine there is a dexterity uh, like you're doing all that stuff and you're doing all that in your head. And then on top of that, there's a dexterity barrier where you got to do inputs and like you have to it, it, it operates very similarly to how like physical sports operate in my opinion where there's like these high skill ceilings and like people are making quick decisions and everything but on top of that you have to move properly and everything is it mainly just recreational or is there like can you like bet with it and stuff too uh i I don't think there's any oh well i you know what i've been kind of out of the loop for melee i wouldn't be surprised if there's some weird uh, underground (laughs) melee betting because like there's like big players and big tournaments and i mean i i wouldn't be surprised if eventually that becomes a thing because a lot of people do watch melee but uh, yeah it's it's very similar to how a sport operates and like uh yeah yeah, it's very tough as a result. <laughs> Interesting. Back to kind of the music stuff, because you've been in the game for so long and you've seen kind of the trends happen, kind of people come and go. What is your thoughts on like today's current bass music climate? I think the producers have got like on average insanely good and like uh, people's people uh, know how to like properly mix down tracks and like get well like even releases like the like now with like ai art you could get like uh even if you don't have any graphic design background you could even get artwork for it so like uh there's a lot of uh, tools that are, are like making it easier for people to do what they want which i think is great but also at the same time it's like people say this every year it's like oh there's so much music you can't even keep up with it oh there's so much music you can't keep keep up with it i mean that's been happening for like five years now the only like uh time where that wasn't the case was uh in quarantine where so many people were just trying to hoard on to their music to release after quarantine which i i personally did not want to do i i'm just like i don't care if there's shows or not happening i'm i have music to put out i'm gonna put it out i don't care if it's necessarily well people are still listening to music and people are still looking for even though it's maybe not gonna aid you as much financially and you know that sort of game plan but people are still looking for new music people are still you know you got to keep the brand alive too i didn't like start listening to dubstep because of shows or anything i started right. listening on the computer and it's like oh like the these music. are show <laughs> yeah. this one's a show heater or anything like that i wasn't really thinking about that i'm like this is a cool track this is a cool track i don't oh, even I like this track I, and i i because being a music fan and being you know in this industry working and stuff i, I don't really like What's your definition of, oh, this is more to play live versus, you know, this is more of a listenable type. That's always a tough thing to necessarily like quantify. But sometimes like uh, it could just be based off of like very like uh, unique, clean sounds. Sometimes it's like based on edits of popular songs. Uh, Sometimes it could be just something really simple and done effectively like a quarter note tune that's just got like interesting sounds and like maybe good fills or something like that. Or it could just be like something formulaic that has worked previously. And I mean, like it's tough to say what necessarily goes off live and what doesn't go off live. And I mean, the people that are like really good at making like bangers that go offline, they generally have a better idea, but you could also just say it's like, Oh, well they might have a better idea of it because that's what it's not necessarily what goes off live but like they understand what their audience wants per se and i think that is a better definition of that if you could change one thing about the industry and kind of the current current market and climate of today's you know bass music scene what would that be that's really tough to say i mean I wish I wish promoters picked me up from uh, the airport more often. That's I'm not joking. Like that is it's a super niche thing, but I hate taking ride shares. I, I just really? rather have like a familiar. I I'd rather have with your like, name a being Uber face. and everything. Come on, <laughs> I, don't, I don't like the thing okay. is I I I think it's so much more enjoyable when uh like and the, this is just my personal opinion that like I understand it's like not every 
like a promoter necessarily has someone dedicated to pick up and drop off artists and everything like that. But uh, I just think it's so much more personable. Like when, when you get to talk to someone about the show, ask them about the show, see what's happening. And that, that used to be like a very standardized thing. Granted, it's like the reason why that isn't anymore is probably just because it's tough to have someone on like for that day doing all that. I feel, I feel like a lot of people, if, well, yeah, I guess it is hard to find people like that. But I would think that a lot of people like being able to pick up, you know, maybe someone who's a fan of your music or someone who's been following you. I, I know for, for my personal experience, I, at one time I got to pick up Atelians and Tosoki from the airport because they played a show for us in, in Sacramento. And uh, like dirt, it was a, one of our drive-in shows. And they designated me to go pick them up from the airport. And I really enjoyed that experience because I got to spend time with some of the producers that I, that I really enjoy listening to. And I'm to. sure and they, just, they enjoyed that too, rather than yeah. just getting some random ass ride share. Yeah, and we, we we went, and I you know I took them to go get food before the show, and I like was kind of just their 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 escort type guy or whatever. Not that's kind of a wrong word for that, but you know what I mean. And and I I think that you know finding someone maybe similar to me, where like I I don't think it, my, I don't even know if I got paid for that, but just having that experience was a good time enough for me to where like I'd be willing to even volunteer for that. You know what I mean? I would think it would be an easy task to do almost well, to find someone who would be I mean, willing to do that. I don't know. I, I It's not like I'm an expert on no, like I know. how yeah, promotion no, I, companies work. And it's such, just a, my head when you're it's saying such that. <laughs> a super minor thing. But it, it like personally for me, I just would rather not do like ride shares. Like it's not like I would say like one out of four are like rides that I would say are comparable to like what a normal promoter would pick me and it's like comparable it's like it's such a i, I feel like an asshole complaining about this <laughs> because it's it so it's sense, so though. minor <laughs> but it's like just yeah i don't know i just <laughs> rather just rather have like a promoter be yeah have one of their guys pick me up and uh just it just i I'd just rather have like a friendly face <laughs> essentially I listened to another podcast that you that you were on. Shout out to the Babs Life podcast, Jacob. But you guys are talking about he, he brought up a good point about, you know, your brand as an artist and talking about like the current climate and stuff. And I think this has even become more prevalent in today's, you know, day and age from when you started, you know, ten or so years ago. But picturing your artist brand not just as, okay, I produce music and I want to tour on this, but also thinking about it from you know, a business standpoint of treating it almost your brand is like your own shop right you have different product mix and stuff like that and i i I thought in that interview you did a great job of breaking that down can you go into depth a little bit about how like your brain works when it comes to that kind of stuff yeah so like the thing is is like i'd say branding is like the literal number one thing you should be concerned about like from at least like a business side if you're doing music as like a fun little hobby then like you don't necessarily need to worry about that but like uh, for any like starting artist who wants to seriously pursue music it's like the number one thing you got to be concerned about is what is my image going to look like online how can i uh make myself recognizable and it's like you could just literally like for example a lot of people a lot of djs in general just dye their hair and you may be saying it's like oh well you're not that recognizable if everyone dyes their hair. But the thing is, most people don't dye their hair. Like, let's say you dye it fucking green. I don't care. But you're like, I'm green boy. Uh, so just, actually, that makes that reminds me. There's already moon boy. But uh, that's, yes, uh, that's a yeah. different thing. Yeah. But uh, uh, let's say you're dyeing your hair magenta. I'm magenta man. That, yeah. I, I, I love magenta. That's my thing. You, if you got magenta, bang my line. <laughs> I'm magenta man. Dye your hair magenta. Only wear magenta clothes, and magenta uh, and then just have just have the have the logo be be fucking grimace. I don't care. <laughs> like, like that. Like that would be that would be something recognizable. And uh, I mean, granted, you're using Grimace, so you might have to variate a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Grimace. <laughs> might, might be a lawsuit there. It's Grimace <laughs> now. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, it's like uh, you have a recognizable, like, personal image. You have a recognizable brand image and, like, a consistent attribute. Some people will do something as simple as, like, uh, always like whenever they comment, they'll like put an emoji that's similar to whatever their brand, something like that. Have you seen the It's Pizza Time guy? Yes. 
dude yeah for, for example yeah. of that like yeah he, if, always if, gone it's there. pizza guy time decided to make dubstep <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna be great for yes for <laughs> branding. the main thing i i have i i just always like cartoons so i've always wanted to like incorporate that into my uh art or music i guess yeah so uh my my thing usually like it used to be like uh my old like uber logo was just like a little smiley guy with his tongue sticking out and a little brain on top and that's sort of evolved so junkyard uh, junkyard la he does pretty much all my art and now it's like black and white super dark usually it's always got the brain in it it's tongue out maybe sometimes or not but i think a lot of people associate like that black white like rubber hose sort of style that's a bit darker with me now which is pretty cool like i think that is really sick and uh, a lot of times is usually indicative of how my music sounds if i had to fucking spam one thing uh it would probably be like the brain emoji that just reminds me i'm like because the next step is like once you have all that you can do merch and i'm like i haven't done merch in fucking like four years or something Gotta like do that it, man it's really expensive yeah, <laughs> and it's, a lot, yeah. And it's a lot to set up that's the, that's the main problem it and, merges uh, a lot of work unless you have something which what we do we use we use teespring but you know it's print on demand service but i think some someone on your level and your stature you know you got to get someone like uh, what's yeah. it, kta and, or some some actual like higher level type merch and it's company. a balance too because you got to print the right amount you don't want to have too many smalls you don't want to have I've too seen a lot larges. of people do like do really well in uh, pre-sales and then only design literally what people have requested or put in for yeah I, i've seen the whole pre-sale thing too it's just like and the problem is like i have to figure all that out while also touring and also making music yeah. and a lot of the times <laughs> yeah. i'm just like Ugh. like and i have designs that i've have saved because I, I have a graphic design background i have designs that i've saved and like i'm also like pretty uh, I wouldn't say like I'm the most fashion oriented, but like as far as like what I want for shirts, I've taken a lot of like concepts and ideas and a lot of times I'm just not in love with any of them. So I don't get them made and I'm just like. Mm. On the topic of, you know, giving advice to newcomers who are wanting to come in to the industry, uh, I th I think it's important to look and obviously why we have you on the show is kind of to look at some of your challenges that you've had as an artist. What has been like, what would you say has been like one of the biggest hurdles, even starting back from like day one? What has uh, been like your, your main challenge throughout the I think the, years? the worst one was me trying to do fucking music while also being in like college at the same time. Cause like I, I, I was going to college for uh, economics. I graduated okay. from Cal State Long Gosh, Beach with what a, a big difference. Bachelor's <laughs> in, in economics, baby. But that was like uh, one of the first tours I did was with Subtronics back in 2017. And I think we did like 25 dates or something like that. And I did that all while I was in school. And that's Holy a fucking shit. nightmare. Don't do that. Yo. Don't do that. How <laughs> I was taking the, I was taking intermediate economics courses and I was just barely getting by and it was fucking terrible. Don't recommend that. Yeah. Um, how much homework did you do on that bus or was it a bus or fly tour? I, it was fly and I, I tried oh. to do as much as possible essentially Holy shit. and tried to do as much studying as I could. But it, it's yeah, that was really bad. <laughs> so I would say that was like the worst, like probably one of the worst things I've done, like had to go through. Like, why did you decide to continue with school, even though you're getting off? My parents just wanted me to, my uh, parents okay. just wanted me to do it. Like my parents are very like traditional. It's like, you get this done, you get this done. Like we'll get you through school, but you have to get that degree. And I'm just like, I don't even know if I want to do this. So, well, yeah. I, here's the thing. Economics is something I really enjoy. It's something I love. And if I had to, uh, like quit doing music for some reason, like I'd probably st pursue something in that field. But it's really funny because like when I started doing music, I was in, I was uh, going to school for essentially going starting to go to school for economics. And what was originally going to be my career path has now turned into more of my hobby. And I still keep up with like econ, like podcasts and stuff like that. And like I keep I want to like know what's going on in like financial markets and shit like that. Not necessarily like stocks, but like uh like for example, like all the bank foreclosure—well, not foreclosures, but uh, all the bank bankruptcies that have been happening with the banks, the bank bankruptcies. Uh, I like learning about stuff like that. 
Um, Why do you have such an attraction to that, do you think? I like money. No. Yeah, man. I like <laughs> no, money. I like money. No. I think it's just really interesting. I mean, the, the just the principles of supply and demand. I think it's just intrinsically interesting, like how people act and what people do and psychology how, side how they're it. using yeah. like their transactions. Like the psychology side of the economics, I think is really, really cool. Has any of that interest or any of that schooling come into play with you being a touring artist? No. Absolutely zero. zero. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the beauty of uh, be, being an artist. You get like uh, it, you really don't have to do any of any of that. There's no math required. I mean, like the only thing you could realistically say like uh, has some sort of economic like uh, principle uh, with being a touring artist is if you're planning a tour and you're deciding what tour season would be a good season to go. Like uh, winter is usually not a good option unless you're a, a bigger act because p the demand tends to be a bit lower just because it's like weather related issues and also people are home like at Christmas and stuff like that. That being said, economics generally like everything has economics like in, like incorporated in it, if it has to do with money. It's not like I am building like fucking models for my developing uh, investment firm <laughs> sort of situation. <laughs> like uh, I'm not being a uh, actuary and, and trying to set up like a, a full like a uh, I don't I, I forget what actuarians do, but they have to use like a shitload <laughs> of math to set up economic models for uh, for businesses. With that knowledge. Do, and obviously, you know, I mean, look at Excision. He's, I don't even know, 40, 50 years old, in mid, midlife. Being that he's still in the game, but, you know, not all artists make it that long in, in their career. Do you have a game plan as far as, like, economics of, like, how you want to, you know, when you are not a touring artist anymore, how you, how your income is going to be set up afterwards? I've, I've never had a game plan when it comes to really? any of this. I'm just taking it. I, I never intended. Whatever uh, happens. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. I'm, I've never intended like doing this as a full time thing. It just sort of happened what it did. And I'm just like, OK, well, if it, I'll, I'll keep it going as long as it keeps going. Back to you talking about, you know, go, being in college and stuff and your parents wanting you to do that. When did they kind of realize like this is what you're naturally going to do anyways, no matter what they like? Did they just like as long as you get through college, we don't give a shit what you do afterwards? Or? Yeah, I think it was mostly just how much money I was bringing in, just like uh, right off the gate. They're like, oh, that's like a that's like an actual job that he's doing. Money talks. Hey, yeah, right. money crazy. talks. <laughs> what would you tell someone? Or what would your advice to someone be if they were kind of in that same position of like, I, I, I'm currently kind of in that position myself. But what would your advice to someone like me be if if their parents are you know people who want them to their families? Let's just generalize this. Their families want them to go the more traditional route, but they're like, dude, this is. That's not really the path I want to take, and I want to do this music thing. What would, I would your advice say, would like, be? Well, for me, it was kind of a weird situation because, uh, like, you did. I didn't even really like uh, know how. Like, I, I was still just doing music for fun. It was not. I, I never really sought out to do this as like a full time thing. It just sort of happened. Situation. Like the thing is, I think that when it comes to anything artistic like endeavors in general, you really should not be concerned about the monetary side until you're concerned about the monetary side, essentially. So it's just like, just do it like for fun. And as long as you're having a good time, that's the important part. And if you start making money along the way, that's great. But un un like, unless you're in a position where it's like, all right, I'm making money right now, but I think if I like, uh, took a year off and just strictly pursued that and like put my all into it, I could do a lot better because there there's like a lot of big names that have done exactly that strategy. Like take like either uh, stop to go to school or quit their job or just, just said I'm taking a year and just pursue only music when they already had something like the ball rolling that like really made the ball roll even harder Go, I guess. yeah and, yeah, uh, yeah but yeah, no, that so that's sense. but that's a tough decision to determine where you want to 
when you want to do that. Because I've also seen people in a similar position where they're like, oh, okay, I think now would be a good time to do that. I'm going to move to LA. I'm going to get like a part-time job and do all that. And I'll hang out with everyone. And it's like, eh. especially the moving to LA thing. Moving to LA can definitely be like a trap. It used to yeah. be like not as much. So like the move, yeah. before quarantine, like moving to LA was actually like, I would say a beneficiary to a lot of people's careers. Oh, sorry. So you're good. I do. <laughs> I do this thing every day where I take a snapshot at 420 o'clock. Nice. <laughs> and uh, I've been doing that for like nine years. <laughs> really? Yeah. Interesting. What, what, what was the purpose behind behind starting Cause that? Because it's funny. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> just <'cause laughs> I'm <not>. I can. <laughs> yeah, literally because it's funny. It's just something I That's do. That's awesome. Yeah, and it fits perfectly for if there's who you one are, thing the I, I your am, branding. <laughs> I'm very consistent <laughs> about yeah. stuff like that. That's probably why you're so successful. I think that's one of the biggest things that I've learned in this game is you know consistency and working your ass off usually prevails even over sometimes even over talent. Um, I mean, if, like if I, talent I doesn't want to work hard, then I wish I was a harder worker. But I also think a lot of people tend to over inflate how hard they necessarily work, but at the same time. Like stuff like that, eh, it takes me literally like three seconds. If anything, it takes me longer to explain the thing <laughs> than yeah. just the actual thing. <laughs> awesome. Well, back to what we were talking about with uh, with your parents and you know getting getting your career started and whatnot. What what was like the biggest takeaway? I guess from you know you learning to overcome them not wanting you you know them kind of having a different idea for the past. It wasn't necessarily like an overcoming sort of okay. moment. It's just like. Uh, once they just saw it, like you said, once they saw the money, it was kind of like a no. Yeah, like because, yeah. like I said, I never really intended on doing music as a full time thing. Like there is, like uh, before that, like uh, I, I have my Coast Crew jersey on. Like I was doing rowing, uh, and I was going to school, and I was just making music on the side, and like as my fun little hobby outside of school. It's just like I said, just something that sort of like the pieces fell together and I'm like, oh, now I'm doing school as a part-time thing and I'm doing music as a full-time thing. And then once uh, I, I finally graduated, granted, like I, I literally graduated at the end of quarantine, I was just like, okay, I'm, I'm done with school and uh, I guess I'm just going to be doing music now. Like, cause but, like I have everything in place. There's no reason for me not to just do music as a full-time thing. And I've always intent, like, especially when I was like touring and doing school as a part-time thing, I'm just like, uh, I intend on just doing this for as long as I can because it's a very unique situation I'm in. So I'd rather also, I'll, I'll, yeah, is uh, essentially I'm, I'm pretty happy. Like, uh, I don't necessarily like I probably could be making more money if I was like an economist or something like that. But I don't think I would be nearly as ha- happy go lucky as I am. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah, so <laughs> taking it back to even what we were talking about earlier with your with the branding and this goofiness and you know craziness of the cartoons and just kind of who what you stand for i think the music thing really fulfills who you who, what what that image is rather than being an econ- economist and sitting behind you know a, a boring desk with a cubicle yeah, i mean like <laughs> hey I, hey this is not a knock on people who do boring desk no, jobs dude, we because need those sometimes people. Sometimes those boring desk jobs, you just sit there and you're just watching YouTube Don't all day. Shit. I'm yeah. like, damn, <laughs> <laughs> I do. Wait, you can get paid for that? Yeah, right. <laughs> I do, I that, do anyways, that already. Damn it. I should have yeah. that. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, we are past an hour now, so we'll wrap up here. But uh, what are, what are some of your goals for the future? What are you what are you looking forward to this year and in, into the next Ooh, you know few years? I'm not gonna lie. I, I've I felt like I've checked off a lot of goals that I've had like when I first start off. But one thing, one thing I've been uh, real, like one of the last things I need is uh, I need a fucking space laces collab. Come on, Ian. Come on, Ian. When he ever gets the time, I got one last thing I need to check off. <laughs> and yeah, then I'll, especially uh, him. Be like, a lot of people, a lot of people know or, or refer to him as one of the, one of the best in the game. And I, I would I, say I, he, I, he's I agree. not only like the best dubstep producer of all time, but also like one of the best like electronic producers of all time. But also, he's really fun to hang with. He's a very yeah, fun well, guy. Hopefully, 
Hopefully he'll see this and he'll get the message. <laughs> yeah, come on, Ian. Hand it over. <laughs> <laughs> Where can the listeners find you and keep up to date with uh, what you have going on in the future? Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm Uber Dub on pretty much everything. I, I, I can't remember if Facebook is Uber Dub Step or Uber Dub, but it's one of the two. I don't really post it that often on my Facebook. Just either, type in so. Uber with a U, not an E. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, very important. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Awesome, man. Well, if, last final question. I, I ask this at the end of every single interview because I think it's a great question for every guest that we have. But if there was one piece of advice that you could give yourself when you first picked up a doll and started making music, what would that be? Oh, pff, I would show myself the fucking hotkeys. <laughs> like, <laughs> like literally, it's like the main like workflow improvements I've had was like learning yeah. learning that uh, like I can just scroll through. Wait, hold on. Let me, because uh, I don't even remember what the actual hotkeys are just off the top <laughs> of my head. I have to open up FL just so that I can remember the muscle memory. It's like hold shift scroll or, an, oh yeah, it's right click and then scroll. Right click scroll is like one of the craziest things I've learned. What does and, that do? Oh, it just allows you to s- like scroll between like paintbrush tool, mute uh. tool, like slice all that and like yeah i would just show myself all like the mouse hotkeys because that is just game Work changer a lot faster yeah it's just a game changer with how fast you can operate yeah i have a i have a one through six uh hotkey like row on my keyboard that have yeah. all basically does the same thing but yeah, yeah. hotkeys are the move man. but like <laughs> mouse hotkeys it's just insane how fast you can operate when they have them available to you yeah yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today, man. I really appreciate you being yeah, on the no podcast. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me this. on. Absolutely.